Our third session today, being Monday the 30th of June, the year of our Lord, 2014. Following in an in a, in a unfolding message today, the first session was an apostolic people. The second session was an apostolic pattern. And the third session is the apostolic purpose. So forgive me for labouring the word apostolic. Um, many, many years ago I, I wrote a newsletter and, and I was giving a report on a, on, a, on a wedding we'd had, amongst other things. And apparently in this newsletter I used the word apostolic 19 times. And someone wrote to me and said, Paul, I think you're a bit imbalanced. You used the word apostolic 19 times in your newsletter and you even talked about an apostolic wedding. What is that? <laughs> So I wrote back and said, well, please forgive me, but we're just trying to restore the balance. It's been so out of balance. So we're probably overemphasizing it purposefully. And why did we call it an apostolic wedding? Because it was a voluntary union of a man and a woman with a common faith held in a district where most people living in the houses all around were in de facto relationships. So I called it apostolic because it's going back to the beginning and establishing the right pattern. Amen. Amen. So we have an apostolic pattern we've talked about. Now we're talking about the purpose of God, an apostolic purpose. So what is the purpose of God? Let's look at a few aspects of it. The purpose of God is to have a mature church in the earth. Would you agree with that? The purpose, um, and that mature church is, is to fulfill God's purpose in the earth. You know, I was told an interesting story a couple of days ago in my house from one of the apostles from Africa. He, he had trained up a young disciple and the young disciple was travelling back into Central Africa where he lived after some months of being in training. He sat beside a woman on the bus and the woman realised he was a young believer so she started talking about heaven and how much she's looking forward to going to heaven and after a while he became impatient and said, excuse me madam, but which verse in the Bible says we're going to heaven? She said, excuse me? He said, you're telling me all about heaven. I'm sick of hearing about heaven because you, you haven't given me one verse of scripture. Oh, she said. And she could think of no verse of scripture. So when they got to the city in Burundi, wherever it was, she rang her pastor and said, Pastor, where you're always talking about going to heaven. Give me some of the verses so I can tell this young man. The father, pastor said, let me ring you back. Finally rang her back and said, I can find none. Let me ring the bishop. So he rang his bishop. Bishop, we've had this question. We've been always preaching about going to heaven, but I've been asked where are the scriptures and I can't find one. Quickly, tell me what they are. The bishop said, I think we have a problem. I can't find any either. You see, the church worldwide has gone about its salvation business blithely ignorant of God's purpose of why there should be a church in the earth and what it's supposed to do. The church is not an embassy of heaven offering visas. In fact, one Ugandan who came here a few years ago, a person that Wilson knows, when he got to Australia he said, it's easier to go to heaven than come to Australia. So God's purpose is to have a mature church in the earth to fulfil God's purpose in the earth. So how is that church to fulfil God's purpose? Well, Romans 1.5 sums it up this way. Paul writing to the church at Rome said, through him, through Messiah Jesus, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. So, so how does the church fulfil God's purpose? Because through, grace, through Christ we have received grace and apostleship. What for? For obedience to the faith among all nations. Flick over here, Steve. All nations. All nations. There's only, there's only a quarter of them up there now. More than a quarter. There's three quarters to come, just under three quarters to come. But all nations to become obedient to the faith 
for the sake of the name of Jesus. So what does that mean? That means there's going to be a church on the earth that's properly and adequately preaching Christ Jesus to every nation and through the grace and the authority of the gift of apostle working in the, in the perfect will of God being sent out from a properly functioning church that every nation we go to will only be allowed to go to when it's the time in the Holy Ghost for that nation to humble down and submit to hear the word of God because obedience literally means to hear under. So there's going to come a time in the life of each nation when there will be at least a season, an oppo- a season, an opportunity to bring the word of God. Many years ago, I was on a sort of business trip to Fiji. It was when I was out of the ministry for a short period and did some strange things and one of them was to go to Fiji. I won't tell you too much about it. He might report me to the Fiji authorities and I'll get arrested. (laughs) But um, So anyway, this, this businesswoman had come from China and part of my job was to drive her from Nandi to Suba. So we hired a car and she'd grown up in communism. She was a communist lady. Even though she'd come from a from a wealthy family before communism, they lost all their wealth in the in the in the what do they call it, the the Cultural Revolution. And then but but as China wanted to redevelop in capitalism, she 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 was raised up again because they could see that she was a good businesswoman. So she was doing business on behalf of China. And as we're driving along how many hours is it from Dandy to Suva? Yeah, so it's quite a long journey. But just at one point, the Holy Spirit said, tell her about Jesus. So in the middle of talking about cultural revolution, how she'd fared in, the, in China and what, what was happening, God just opened a window and I spoke to her about Jesus. I saw the window open. It was like literally a car window went down. I spoke about Jesus and the window went back up again and I stopped speaking about Jesus. I just needed to shut up again. That's just a simple little example of a window of opportunity. Often in the lives of individual people, and according to Paul, even in the lives of nations, in the life of nations, there's an opportunity when the word of God will penetrate. When the nation will will humble down to hear the word. Amen? And so Paul says, through grace, grace has been the most underestimated thing in the history of the Pentecostal church because the Pentecostal church of which I've been a part of we emphasised power, gifts, anointings and that was about the end of our vocabulary so we might have a few other words then to go along with it I don't know if some of you have been in Pentecost many years when did you ever hear a sermon on grace? when was the grace of God ever opened up for you to become something that you could access? But brethren, the power of God is for witness. It's it's not to help me and you grow. But but Paul says it's through grace that we reach nations. Isn't that awesome? It's not through power. It's through grace. Because grace is of the very nature of the personhood of God. God is full of grace. He He is gracious. He said that to Moses again in Exodus 34. He said, I am gracious. God is overflowing with grace and it's through grace that comes to us through Jesus Christ that, that this gift of apostleship is, is, is activated to reach nations. So, what is this mature church then that will fulfil God's purpose? In Ephesians chapter 4, and, and I know many of my audience here are familiar with this teaching, but for the sake of those who aren't and those for whom the, the, the messages are going on video and, and, and CD, I need to go through it briefly with you. In Ephesians chapter 4, the whole chapter is an amazing chapter, but, but, but verses 4 to 6, an amazing declaration that seems to be ignored mostly by the modern church. What does it say? There is one and one, one spirit. There is one hope of your calling, by which you're called. There is one Lord, one faith and one baptism. That's six ones so far. And there's one God and Father, who is over all and through all and in all. Seven ones. 
Again, let me ask you, when did you last preach on the seven ones? When have you ever heard anyone preach on the seven ones? And yet, and yet this, this, is, this is the kernel of the revelation of God. That this one body and one spirit. If the Presbyterian church is part of the body, then they have the same spirit as the Pentecostal church. Maybe not as manifest, etc., etc. There's only one spirit. So if you claim to be part of the body, then you have to accept the spirit. Amen. There's one hope of our calling. What's that hope, by the way? Think about it. And then there's one Lord. How many lords are there? One. Only one. One faith. faith. Only one faith. Yeah. And one baptism. One baptism. And one God and Father. And so to understand those ones, because they're so important, what did Jesus do? He gave us the five-fold ministry. You see, if you put Ephesians 4.11 in the context of the whole chapter, what is part of the job of the five-fold? To bring the church to the knowledge of the seven ones. That there's one body. We need to preach the one body. We're not, we're not building our own church. God forbid. And may you pastors and presidents and apostles, whatever you call it, stop building your own church. It's not your church. Never was, never will be. Amen. So get off the back of God's people and start being humble servants, bringing the word of God. Because there's only one body and it belongs to Jesus Christ. It's the very body of Christ of which we are made members as it pleased God. He's the builder of the body. He's the one who takes me and places me in the body through baptism. So why did God give the fivefold? If you go back before Ephesians 4, 7, it's to bring the church to a deep understanding and appreciation of the seven ones. And what does seven mean? It's a completeness. If you can understand those seven ones, you'll be not far from perfection. When you really get the revelation of the one body, the one spirit, the one hope, the one faith, the one Lord, Lord, the one baptism, the one God and Father, wow! You'll know all things. And how are you going to grow into that knowledge? Well, verse 7 says that to each one of us, each member of the body, grace has been given according to the measure of Christ's gift, the gift of Christ. So because God has given Christ to us, we receive grace to understand and enter into the, into the working knowledge of those seven ones. Isn't that awesome? But it is written, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. So the gift of Christ in verse 7 becomes gifts in verse 8. And then it goes on to a deep mystery there in verse 9 and 10 about ascending and descending and ascending. And but when he ascended, what did he do? What were these gifts? Verse 11 tells us. He gave some. Wiggle your thumb. Say apostle. Point with your finger and say prophet. Reach out with your long finger and say evangelist. And this is the ring finger for the family, the pastor. And put the little finger in your ear and say teacher. What is it? Apostle. Prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. And why did he give those ministries? To, to, to equip or to perfect the saints. If you look into that deeply, it's, it's to set the body in order to function. It's, it's, it's every member functioning, contributing to the whole. And it's, and it's to do the work of the ministry. Which work of the ministry? You see, at the Machakos Maturity Convention, their slogan was, Equipping the saints for the works of service. Wrong translation. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says perfecting the saints or equipping the saints for the work of the ministry for the building up of the body of Christ. Who's doing the work of the ministry? The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, pastors and teachers. If you want, wait for the body to do the ministry, no, it can never happen. Because Christ actually went into hell and rose up on high and gave five gifts 
that will do that work and only they can do it. doesn't matter how much you prime the saints up, they can never do that work of ministry. It takes a prophet to be a prophet. It takes an apostle to be an apostle. It takes a pastor to be a pastor. It takes a teacher to be a teacher. And it takes an evangelist to be an evangelist to release the grace of Christ so the church can grow to maturity. Amen. And so in, in wanting to be very modern in our understanding, you know, equipping the saints for the works of service. Rubbish. No, it's doing the work of the ministry of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor and teacher to equip the saints and to build up the body of Christ until we all come to the unity of the faith. That one faith to the knowledge of the Son of God. Unto a perfect man. According to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. No longer children running after this miracle worker and that prophet. You know, people in Zimbabwe, which, is, which has become as poor as a church mouse, they, they, save, they give their life savings to fly to Nigeria to sit in the meeting of prophet. What's his name? T.B. Joshua. Joshua. We're going on a pilgrimage to get a word from T.B. Joshua. They, they, they go into debt to make a pilgrimage to sit in his meeting personally. And then in Ghana... They're all saving up to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. They say, if the Muslims can go to Mecca, we Christian pastors will go to Jerusalem. Wow. <laughs> you reckon? You only get more religion, probably. A different form. See, people go for wrong motive, you don't get anything. You go to Jerusalem as a religious tourist, that's what you are, a religious tourist. But you can go and look at the statue of Christ over, over Rio de Janeiro and have an experience. So I agree with you, yes, you can have an experience if you go to the places. But not, they're not guaranteed. Most of the people who are in, in Rio looking at that statue are just tourists having a big time, kissing each other and cavorting. Where are we? <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. But rather, speaking the truth in love one to the other. You know, unfortunately, we still live in a climate where most ministers won't even talk together about anything other than platitudes and superficial nonsense. But what do you really believe? You know, the depth of fellowship in our house for the last two or three days has just been awesome. As, as, we, as we, you know, gnaw down to the bone. And even suck the marrow out of the bone. Because we're talking reality. We're talking life. We're talking history. We're talking the destiny of nations. And so we need the fivefold to function properly to bring forth that awesome church that's spoken of in verse 16. That's properly functioning in agape love. So what about, how else is this, is this purpose of God going to be fulfilled in the earth through his church? Let's have a look at Ephesians chapter 5. And the key passage from verse 22 to 33. About the bride of Christ, the church. The bride. The wife. This, this, this mature church is submitted to the Lord. Christ is the head of us and he is also our saviour. Isn't that awesome? Therefore, as the church, we are to be subject to Christ in everything. Is all of your life submitted to Christ? You know, in, in the break, I don't want to embarrass anyone, but a brother just gave me his tithe because he's submitting to Christ. You know, that sort of thing just touches my heart when someone makes a conscious decision to give a tithe because they're submitting to Christ. I don't think I've mentioned tithing today, have I? But a brother brings a tithe to me in the break. It's a humbling experience. So we're to be subject to Christ in everything. 
You can't say, well, tonight's my night off, I'm going to watch a movie. It, it may be okay to watch a movie. If you want to watch a good movie, watch God's Outlaw. That'll really scare you. Get you ready for the fire. But, but, you know, I'm not saying any of those things are wrong, but are you submitting to Christ in it or are you choosing to do what you feel like doing? Christ loves us and he gave himself for us. And he is sanctifying us and cleansing us by the washing of the water of the word. That's the Rima word there. Are you receiving the word? Do you even bother to open your Bible on a daily basis to find out what God might want to say to you and to learn the word? You see, this, this, it's totally valid and, and purposeful and meaningful for you to read the word every day. Why should you not do that if the Bible is the word of God? Why should you find time to do other things but not read the word? We need, to, we need to become, and see, unless we're receiving the word, it's, it's not going to be so likely for God to speak to us through the Rima word. But if we keep immersing ourselves in the word, sooner or later, God, God's going to respond to the hunger of your heart. You know, I met a pastor in Burma a few years ago, and his story was, David, that he grew up in the Buddhist. He attended that main Sri Dagon, the main temple in, 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 in the capital. It used to be the capital of Yangon. And someone, a Christian friend of his, gave him a Bible. So, for t- over two years, he read the Bible through, twice, and then on the third time, he got saved. You get that? As a, as a, as a sincere, seeking Buddhist, when his friend gave him a Bible, he read it. And nothing happened. In that sense. But he had a desire to read it again. So he read the second. Can you imagine a Buddhist reading the Bible through twice? And many Christians haven't even read it through once. I was telling Julius he was shocked, but I've even met pastors who have never read the whole Bible through. And on the third time, the brother became a born-again Christian. We, we've seen a video of a, of a Muslim man who was charged by his sheikh or his imam, what it was, you need, to start, you need to get that book and, and, and write a refutal of it from the, a rebuttal of it from the Quran. And the young man said, I don't want to do that. I don't want to touch that book. You, I, you've been teaching me all these years. That's a terrible book. Why are you going to ask me to read that book? I don't want to read that book. That's terrible. And the imam insisted. He said, I'm going to pay you money. You read that book and write why it's wrong from your knowledge of the Quran. You bring out all the errors. And so the young man submitted. And the terrible thing was he could find no errors. And so he wrote a report and said, sorry, Iman, but there's no errors in that Bible. It's true. And of course the Iman got really angry and threatened to kill him and, and he had to run away and become a Christian. So there's, no, there's nothing wrong and everything is right with you becoming a devoted reader of the Bible. Amen? Hallelujah. Because Jesus is sanctifying and cleansing his church with the washing of the water of the word. Now that word, word there is Rima. Rima means the preceding word, the quickened word. But how's that word going to come to you if you never read the Bible? If you don't immerse yourself? Don't necessarily read other people's books about the Bible. Read the Bible. Don't even bother to read too many footnotes in your Bible if you've got a study Bible. Just read the Bible. Look up cross-references, they're really good. Look up literal meanings, that's really good, it'll help you. But read the Bible. Search it out. Call out to God. Ask him to help you. Because Jesus himself is sanctifying and cleansing his church with the washing of the water of the word. Why? That he might present her to himself as a glorious church. So what's Jesus doing in the earth? Sanctifying and cleansing this church which he has saved, which he's the head of, which he, whom he died for. He's cleansing us and washing us so that we might become a glorious church without spot or wrinkle 
or any such thing to be holy and without blame. Wow. So the Bible says that Jesus is doing this. Where is he doing it? In heaven or on earth? Where is he doing it? Come on, let's be frank. He has to do it in the earth. There's nothing in the Bible that says he's going to continue working on his church in heaven. He's working in the church now, every moment of every day, through the word, being quickened to us. You see, that word, Rima, there, it's the same word that gives us faith. Now, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing cometh by the word. Again, it's the Rima word. So as the word becomes quickened in your life, you know what to do. I believe even our young brother Edema, who's flying out of Abu Dhabi anytime soon. Yes, yes. yes. weren't you here when I started shouting at lunchtime? Oh, oh you, should, you should have heard me from your home. I was so excited. He sent me a text from Abu Dhabi. He's in the airport. Good. At one o'clock he was in the airport there. No way. We get our Western Union back now. Wasn't needed. Yeah, you can go ho. <laughs> ho! Where were we, Nicholas? The seven letters in the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, how does each one end? Who is the promise to? Who is the reward given to? The overcomers. So, so what sort of a church is Jesus looking for in the earth? A church of overcomers. A church of overcomers. Hallelujah. Not a church of Sunday worshippers. Not even a church of Sunday worshippers who also go to the prayer meeting on Wednesday night or the Bible study. He's looking for overcomers. People who overcome being, being, being hassled by that difficult person at work every day. People overcome being abused when they go for an interview somewhere. People overcome when they've got a very difficult person that they're, that they're trying to teach something, whatever it is. Seven letters and all the, all the rewards are to the overcomers. So what happens to the rest? They don't get the rewards. So where do you want to be? You have to be an overcomer. You don't have any choice. Even if you get knocked down ten times, you've got to get up for the eleventh round. Yeah. Amen? You do. Yeah. You have to be willing to get up again. Yeah. You know, again, not wanting to embarrass anybody, but another person came to me and broke and said, Paul, I, I just want to be part of this. I want to receive you as my apostle. I, I want to relate properly to you and Janet. Please forgive me for the past. It's all forgiven. Amen? Amen. Because we're deciding to be overcomers here today. Yeah. Hallelujah? We're making quality decisions to be overcomers. Amen. To trust God for everything. To forget the past and reach for that which lies ahead. Pressing toward the goal. Amen. Amen. <laughs> because what is the goal? Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 14 tells us what the goal is. That the knowledge of the glory of the eternal one will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. It's the knowledge of the glory. So how are we going to get knowledge? Through discipleship. And so how, do we be, how does God fulfill this purpose? Through the Great Commission. Jesus, when he rose from the dead, having, according to, let's go to Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, look carefully at this with, with me please because this is going to upset a lot of your previous teaching. Acts chapter 2, verse 24. Peter is giving a very summary um, preaching on who Jesus is. Verse 22, he's a man of signs and wonders. Verse 23, he died, crucified. Verse 24, God raised him up. Having loosed him, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he would be held by it. That's what the New King James says. And I've not found any translation that does it properly. But that pains of death does not mean pains of death. Even if you've got the Spiritual Life Bible, look in your margin against the little number two. Verse 23, 
Number two, what to say? Birth pangs. So Jesus wasn't suffering pain in hell. Jesus' pain finished when he said, it is finished. No more suffering. The book of Peter tells us that when Jesus died, he died in the flesh, but he was made alive in the spirit. They put a dead body in the tomb, but where was Jesus? Doing his stuff down there. He wasn't being tormented by demons. Come on! He wasn't in prison. Come on! He's the Lord of glory. He's died on the cross. He's finished that work and now he's just going down there to clean up. And amongst other things, according to Ephesians 4, verse 9 and 10, to bring up the gifts to release to the church in his, resur- in his ascension. Because he said he had to go down first. That he might go up and give gifts. Uh-huh. So the birth pangs. So what was Jesus doing for the, for the three days he's in the grave? Bringing forth the new creation. So when he rose from the dead, everything was changing. From the moment he died to the moment he rose from the dead, everything is changing. And what's the proof of it even? Matthew 27, 52 is an amazing verse. Some people say you shouldn't take much notice of that. Paul is not confirmed anywhere else in the scripture. But the fact is it's in the scripture. So let's have a look at it. Matthew 20, 27, 52. Starting verse 51. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Notice it was torn from? Top to bottom. Not from bottom to top. It wasn't anything that man could do. It happened from heaven down. And the rocks was, and, and there was an earthquake and the rocks were split, verse 52, and the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the graves, when? After his resurrection. So those two verses, and appeared to many, those three verses cover the whole period from the moment Jesus died and the veil was rent to when he rose from the dead. You can, you, can you see that? Because even after he rose from the dead, it said it wasn't until after he rose that the bodies of the saints were seen. So this, that whole period, whether it's you know, two and a half days or three days and three nights, not interested in that argument at all, but whatever time it was from when Jesus died to when those saints rose, it's all part of the process of Jesus completing his work down below. Are you with me? Hallelujah. So how do we get on all that? The birth pangs. See, Jesus wasn't being tormented in hell at all. He was going through birth pangs. The literal word is birth pangs. There's no reason why any translator should put pain in there, except it be the pain of childbirth. But they've got it in the context of the pain of death, which gives the wrong understanding of the word. It's the birth pangs that he went through after he died in the flesh to bring forth the new creation in the spirit. We're talking about God's purpose in the earth. Jesus had to come and die and go down below in the spirit to bring forth the new creation because the new creation is where? In the earth. The earth was cursed. The earth was under sin. And, and while there was that whole period of the law when, when through the blood of bulls and goats and calves and, and sheep we, we could have some covering and, and some small discourse with God if we belonged to the Jewish nation, the Israel, but the rest of us were totally left out. Why? Because we're, we're, st- we're living in offence to God until Jesus comes. So, so it's an enormous thing that Jesus is doing. Death, burial, how many times does Paul actually say death, burial and resurrection? You In 1 Corinthians 15, 3-4, Paul's giving us the basis of the gospel and he says Jesus was, died, was it? According to the scriptures, he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Jesus was buried according to the scripture. He had to be buried because there had to be stuff done down there. 
to bring forth a new creation. I hope you're not getting sleepy on me. Hallelujah. Because, because Habakkuk said, come back to there, Habakkuk said by, by revelatory prophetic word that the knowledge of the glory of the eternal one will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. So that's God's eternal purpose in summary. That God, is, God has got a plan for the earth. It's not a rescue mission to take you to heaven. Hello. It's not a rescue mission to take you to heaven. God's got a plan for the earth. God created the earth for his purposes. Amen. And his purpose will surely come to pass. Amen. And in the earth, the knowledge of God's eternal purpose will become known. It's knowledge. It's something that we learn. Something that we're taught. That's why Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them. And lo, I'm with you until the end of the world, the King James says. The word more probably literally means the end of the age. So what did Jesus tell us to do? Get ready for a rescue mission? No, he said, you go and make disciples who will come to know the knowledge the knowledge of the glory of the Eternal One. Who would say, since you've become a serious disciple, you, you know a bit more about God and His purpose? Hey? Because that's just God's way. He said, you go and make disciples. He trained the apostles properly. He said, now you go and make disciples. And they'll come to understand my purpose too. And then they'll tell somebody else. And they'll tell somebody else. And then the ones they tell, tell somebody else. And so God's original mandate to Adam will be fulfilled. Be fruitful and multiply and fill heaven. No, he never said that. From beginning to end, God is concerned about filling the earth with the knowledge of his glory. So he told Adam and Eve, you fill the earth and you subdue that enemy under your feet and you have dominion over the earth and all the works of my hands. Hallelujah. And when Noah landed on dry land and made a sacrifice, God spoke to Noah and said, Noah, be fruitful, multiply and get ready for a rescue. No, he'd already had the rescue mission, which was to keep him alive in the earth. God didn't take Noah to heaven while the trouble happened in the earth. He kept him safe in the earth. And Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. God is preserving a people, the righteous, in the earth to bring forth his purpose. And according to Jesus in Matthew 13, verses 40 to 42, he says, Even as the tares were gathered into fire and burn, so shall it be at the end of the age. I'll send out my messengers, literally, and they will take out of my kingdom, where's his kingdom? In the earth, all things that offend and those who commit lawlessness. Who's going to be taken out? Those who offend God and commit lawlessness. And who's going to be preserved? The sons will shine forth. The righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. That's not talking about a heavenly vision. That's talking about an earthly fulfilment of God's word. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, let's preach the gospel. The gospel is so radical. It's so revolutionary. It's going to change nations. It's going to rescue creation from the curse. So how do we, how do we get into this fulfilment of God's purpose? Well, Hebrews 6 verse 1 and 3 says that we should go on to, let us go on to perfection. It's almost like God saying in the beginning, let us, let us do this in creation. So now in the New Testament he's saying, let us go on to, the Apostle saying, let us go on to perfection. If God permits. And what, on what basis will God give us the permit to go on into the perfect? If the foundations are right. So we have to lay the foundations. It begins by laying foundations. What are the six foundations in verse 1 and 2? 
Repentance from dead works. Repentance from doing church according to man's tradition. According to our own ideas. Time for change. Secondly, putting our faith in God through Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus said to Peter in John 14:1, You believe in God, now it's time to believe in me. You believe in God, Peter. That's easy to believe in God, even the devil believes in God. But now it's time to believe in me. Folks, it's time to believe in Jesus, the Messiah. Hallelujah. Number three, the doctrine of baptism. Baptism for the repentance of your sins, but actually the remission of your sins. Baptism to receive the Spirit. Baptism to be placed into his body. Baptism to be immersed in his name. And then receive the laying on of hands to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be blessed, commissioned and ordained. Hallelujah. See, ordination is finally not just for five-fold ministers or elders or even just for deacons. It's every priest has to be ordained. And we're all meant to be priests. Every king has to be crowned. We're all meant to be kings. Amen? Amen. Think about it. Number five, the resurrection of the dead. Walking in the resurrection. How many of you are born again here today? That means you're already risen. Jesus said in John 5.25 that hour is coming and now is. When those who are dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and live. On what basis are you born again? You heard the word and you believed it and you got born again. So you're already risen. You've already escaped the... You've already got the first resurrection. So you, don't, you, so you don't face the second death. Praise be to God. You're going to live forever. Hallelujah. We shall live forever. Whosoever believeth in the Son of God shall not perish, but everlasting life. So if you die, does that mean you don't have everlasting life? If you die physically? Yes, what? Of course, you just, you just change your focus. You're not only looking out through these eyes, you're looking through another set of eyes. Hallelujah. Amen. And number six, eternal judgment. You know, the writer of the Hebrews, he said that, that walking in the doctrine of eternal judgment is a foundation. And it is. It's based on your decision, my decision, to believe in Jesus or not. You know, I heard a preacher the other day on the radio saying that, uh, that nobody's going to be in, heaven, in hell because of their sins. Because Jesus already died for our sins. They're only going to be in hell because they refuse to accept Jesus. Do you get that? No one's going to be in hell for their sins because Jesus died for all sins. All sins can be forgiven because Jesus came and died. So nobody goes to hell because of their sins. They go to hell because they refuse to accept Jesus. Isn't that a different emphasis? See, if we preach Jesus, then people have a real choice. Because everybody's sins can be forgiven. Nobody needs to go to hell. Not one. So, so once these foundations are laid, what sort of people should we be? Let's go back to Hebrews 5 verse 12. See, God's purpose is for the knowledge of the glory of Yahweh, the Eternal One, to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Have you noticed, older people, that the young generation, and for some of us it's your grandkids, they know all about telephones and computers. Amen? But how much do they know about the glory of God? That those same, self-same younger generation that you know, might be your own family, your own kith and kin, how much do they know about the glory of God? It's one thing to know about technology, but finally that doesn't help us much at all. Unless they help, they use that technology to access 
the knowledge of the glory of God. Mm. Yeah. Amen? And so the Apostle says in Ephesians 5.12, for though by, Hebrews 5.12, for though by this time you ought to be experts in technology. No. <laughs> by this time you ought to be teachers. You need to be able to teach others about the glory of God. And how do you do it? By teaching these foundations. So once the foundations are in your life, then you need to teach others. And yes, if, if, if using a computer helps you to teach them, yes, learn about computers. But, but the computer itself is not going to teach them about God. It's what you put in the computer for them. What they watch and listen to. You know, I think Julius and George were suitably impressed this morning, Alberta, when I, I just showed them the listen to the bilingual school on Spreaker for a few moments. Oh, we can do that in Swahili. So now I'm under real big pressure to do bilinguals in Swahili. <laughs> so by this time, you ought to be teachers. So we grow up in discipleship from being disciples to become teachers. But, but this mob, to put it in indigenous terms, they're in trouble with the apostle because they should be teachers by now, but he says, you have need for someone to teach you again the foundational principles of the oracles of God and you've come to need milk and not solid food. Folks, we're going to grow up and eat the, eat the meat. We need the solid food. We need to grow. If we stay on milk all our lives, it means we've still got nappies on. Is that what you all call them? <coughs> Diapers. It's time to graduate. Take yourself to the toilet. Come on. It's time to eat the meat. Stop pooing your pants. Because what is this meat? Hebrews 5.13 It's the word of righteousness. <laughs> yes, tell that boy of yours to hurry up and grow up. Because everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. Are you skilled in the word of righteousness? Can you speak of Jesus with conviction and clarity? Can you show people in the word who he is? Can you explain to a Muslim that it's not an argument about whether Jesus is son of God, is son of God or not, mate. He's God. If we only partake of the milk, we're unskilled in the word of righteousness. What's the word of righteousness? It's the faith. The only way anyone becomes righteous is by faith. So it's preaching the word. Jude says in verse 3 that he's going to write to the brethren for some other reason, but he said, but I, have, but I've, I had to change my letter to urge you to contend earnestly for the faith. Which faith? The faith that the apostles gave us. The faith which was, how's it go again quickly? For once and for all, delivered to the saints. Do you even know what that faith is? That you can fight for it. Stand up for it. Burn at the stake for it. Be put in prison for it. Do you know that faith? Because that's the faith we'll die for. With a, with a smile on our face. And people see the glory of God. You know, when Nero, the horrible emperor of Rome, was killing Christians by the thousands, he used to feed them to the lions in the arena. And, and as these Christians were just about to be gnawed by the lions, they started singing. <coughs> And suddenly the arena is filled with the beautiful sound of heavenly singing as all these martyrs enter into heavenly places and the fire and the lions didn't hurt them. And Nero got even more angry. So he, he went from lions to, to fire. He said, burn them. So as the flames are starting to lick their bodies, again, the heavenly songs start to break forth. And they all died with smiles on their faces, giving glory to God. 
for the knowledge of the glory of Yahweh will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. So what is God's purpose? It's the establishment of God's kingdom on the earth. Modern terms, we should say God's government. It's a kingdom, but it's, also, it's a government. It's a government by the king. For unto us, a child is born. Unto us, a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. Verse 7, of the increase of his government and of peace there shall be no end. It's a kingdom of peace. It's a government. It's an administration. And God's purpose is for his kingdom to be established in the earth, to be clearly established, seen, functioning. And all those who offend and all those who commit lawlessness will be taken out of his kingdom. So in closing, how do we get into the purpose of God? Very easy. Repent. Change your mind. Believe. It's not to believe what the Bible actually says. Stop just believing a little part of the Bible that's been encapsulated in the evangelical message of the 20th century. Say the sinner's prayer, get saved and go to heaven. Believe the gospel. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Oh, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. What do you believe? What's it mean to say, Lord, who is Jesus? What's it mean to call him Christ? The early apostles preached Christ. Be baptised into Messiah Jesus. Into his name. Jesus said, baptising them into the name. Which name? The name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Oh, that name. What name is that? You know, when Moses was talking to God at the burning bush and God said, you're going back to, to deliver my people out of Egypt. And Moses wasn't very happy about that, but he said, finally, he said, well, if I go and tell them that I'm coming in the name of the, in the God of Abraham, Isaac and Joseph, and they, Isaac, what, what did I say? Joseph. Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, and they ask me, what's his name? What will I say? So it wasn't enough for Moses to go to the people of God and say, I'm coming to you in the name of? I'm, I'm coming from the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. But they'll ask me, what is his name? What will I tell them? And in the 21st century, it's no, it's no good going to, to, a, to an unreached people group in Africa and say, I'm coming to you in the name of the Father, Son and the Holy Ghost. What's his name? We ain't heard of him. What's his name? Oh, Jesus. Oh, yeah, we've heard a bit about him. Tell us more. Are you getting it? See, the Father, Son and the Holy Ghost have a name. It's a revealed name. And Jesus said, baptising them into the name. And in both Hebrew and Greek, the word name means the person. It means all that that person is. You know, we were talking in our home last night about let's stop changing names. Julius was quite adamant we're not allowed to call him Gaia Bugger or something. His, his name is Bagaya, not, not Wagabaya. <laughs> so we're not to change his name. If we change his name, we, he won't know who he is and neither will we. <laughs> so what's the name? There are many fathers in the world, but what's his name? There's many sons in the world, but what's his name? And so the church has been baptising in the name of an unknown God. We baptise you in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Ghost. What name? And I mentioned this in Africa once when I was asked to do some baptisms. I said to the pastor, what name? And he said, what do you mean? Well, Jesus said to baptise in the name of the Father, Son and the Holy Ghost. What name do you baptise in? He says, in the name of the Father, Son and the Holy Ghost. What name? And he said, what do you mean? I said, 
what's the name? It's the name of Jesus, isn't it? He said, oh no, the Jesus, only people do that. We don't do that. That's a cultish thing. Has he read the Bible? Apparently not. What name did Peter baptise in? What name did Paul baptise in? What name did Philip baptise in? There's only one name given under heaven. It's a name. Not names, name. We need to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You know, in, in my experience, some people come into the apostolic out of evangelical faith and they want to bypass Pentecost. You know, oh, I don't speak in tongues, so I'm not interested in that. But you, you can't. You, the apostolic is, as, as a sense, representing the, the final feast of tabernacles. You can't jump from one to the other. You have to pass through every feast because there's an experience and a knowledge added to you as you pass through the feasts. And so we need to come to Passover. We need to get involved in unleavened bread, putting the leaven out of our lives. We need to be baptised into the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Then we need to journey in, in that harvest season of being fruitful and be filled with the Holy Spirit so we can have the strength and the power for the journey that's ahead of us. And then we hear the, the trumpet call. We come to the great day of atonement. And it's only if we come there are we allowed to enter into the Feast of Tabernacles. God said, if you don't turn up at the Feast of Atonement, I'll destroy you. You'll no longer belong to my people. Every one of us has got to come to that place. So you can't sidestep Pentecost and hope to get to the Day of Atonement. Because you need the power of the Holy Spirit. And we need to walk in resurrection life, able to lay down our lives for the gospel. In a sense, martyrdom is the final proof of someone walking in resurrection life. Because it's not a problem. It doesn't even necessarily hurt. Because of the glory of God revealed. Walking in the power of the resurrection and preaching eternal judgment, which is just as rightly translated as eternal condemnation. So what does that mean? That whosoever believeth in him shall not perish. In John 3.16, the most well-known scripture in the world today is about eternal judgment. But we quoted as some little platitude. The Bible says, Jesus himself said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that one who came forth, who came from, who came out of God, God himself manifest in the flesh, who gave his only begotten Son, that whomsoever should believe in him should not that means to be destroyed, to die, but have everlasting life. We are to be walking in this realm of eternal judgment every day. Warning people, encouraging people, helping people understand eternal judgment. And only then can we go on to maturity and truly, fully enter in to the eternal purpose of God which is to come into the knowledge that Isaiah reports in chapter 6 when he's being commissioned. He said, I saw the Lord, Yahweh, the Eternal One, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And then he said, I saw the seraphim, six-winged creatures, flying backwards and forwards before the throne of God. And they were saying, Holy, Holy, Holy is Jehovah, God Almighty. Heaven and earth. Heaven and? Heaven and? Heaven and? Fill, full of your glory. They saw it as a done thing. When we have eyes to see, it'll be there. The kingdom awaits us. It's just there. The kingdom awaits to be manifest in us. 
And it comes through being faithful disciples. The knowledge of the glory of the eternal God covering the earth as the waters covered the sea from Johannesburg to Perth. (laughs) Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.